What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, you're living in a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss under the sit down video. As always, we are presented by Barstool Sports. And before we get into the video, I want to wish everyone a very happy holidays. If you are watching this before Christmas or even during or after Christmas, I hope you have a great Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and a very happy new year. Thank you for watching. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get in to another very interesting organized crime topic. And one of the names over the last 20 years in the American mafia that we've heard a lot but don't know much about is the current alleged boss of the Genovese crime family. At one point, the federal government would say this man, Barney Belomo, was the most powerful individual in the American mafia. The question now is who runs the family and is Barney still the head of the Genovese crime family? Let's get in to his very interesting life. Next, on Sit Down Shorts, Laborio Belomo was born January 8th, 1957, in the Bronx, New York. Now, for Barney Belomo, his father, Salvatore Tato Borello, uh, was actually a soldier in the Genovese crime family. He was very much connected in East Harlem with people like Tony Salerno. Now, in the 70s, uh, Salvatore Belomo would actually get sick and was uh, facing the very real possibility that he was going to die. So what he did in his final months and days is went to his skipper, Fat Tony Salerno, and essentially said, hey, look, uh, my kid is is in his late teens. Um, he don't really have anybody out here. Um, I don't know what he's going to be in life, but he's around me, and I was hoping that you would take care of him. Basically, Fat Tony said, you don't have to worry. We'll keep him uh, safe, and, and we'll take care of him. Down the road, Salvatore Belomo would die. And young Barney Belomo in his late teens uh, would have to face the world without his father. Now, for Barney Belomo, he would actually spend a year at Farmingdale State College, uh, which back then was, you know, essentially the State University of New York at Farmingdale in Suffolk County, Long Island. But he wouldn't last very long in college. He would head to the streets. And Barney Belomo would slot right in with people in Fat Tony's crew, including Vinny the Fish Kafara, who actually, by the end of 1977, would sponsor a 20-year-old Barney Belomo to be inducted into the Genovese crime family. In late 1977, essentially the last making ceremony of that year, alongside another individual, Barney Belomo would be inducted into the Genovese crime family the induction ceremony would take place at an East Harlem pizzeria. Now, again, think of what we just said. Think of your uh, family or friends of yours when you were 20 years old. This is an individual that is 20 years old and is inducted into a mafia family. This is very, very um, not normal. I guess we could say uh, there are very few people that were inducted at such a young age. I think of people like John Franzese or Harry Riccoboni, Harry Riccobini, who um, were inducted in their teens, allegedly. But Belomo was a prodigy, if you will. He was a guy that I think people very much recognized very early on, had the leadership capabilities um, that would spurn him into ascension uh, deep down the road. Now, for Bonnie Belomo in the late 70s, he would be placed uh, in the 116th Street crew, uh, in that crew of Severio Sammy Black Santora. Now, Santora was a longtime member of the Genovese crime family and was very close with people like Tony Salerno. Now, for Sammy Black, he would take upon the new role of mentor uh, to uh, his mentee, Barney Belomo. Now, Belomo would get very involved in the uh, New York City and vicinity district council of Carpenters Union locals. There were many different locals in and around New York, and Belomo very quickly uh, got involved in them. Uh, he was uh, running Carpenters Unions all over the city 
and was really instrumental in controlling the flow of jobs, pension funds, and other things, not only for that uh, union, but for um, you know construction projects like the Jacob K. Javits Center. Um, he was giving plenty of people jobs. And what this was ultimately leading to was these unions were essentially controlled by the Genovese crime family. And that's what allowed them to make so much money uh, from the 80s into the 90s. Now, we would learn very quickly, Barney Belomo not only was a leader, but he was gaining a lot of respect. Um, really by 1982, into the mid-1980s, Sammy Black Centora would um, have some health issues and he would kind of be, um, you know, kind of retired in a way. Uh, Barney Baloma would take upon a uh, captain. He would get captain by 30 years old and would take control of the 116th Street crew. He was also starting to have certain uh, confrontations that were developing, but it was mainly very clear that he was going to win a lot of those confrontations. One of the confrontations he would have was with this individual, uh, Peter DeFeo. Now, DeFeo was a longtime union racketeer, and he had his teeth in a lot of different carpenters' unions. One of the carpenters' unions he controlled was a union out of the Bronx, Local 17. Now, Local 17 was DeFeo's union, but ultimately, Barney Belomba would wrestle control away from DeFeo. And in the late 80s, Bobby Manna would actually give full control to Barney Belomo. Uh, so he would win control away from the old timer, Peter DeFeo. So this is the kind of respect that Barney Beloma was gaining from people uh, like Mana and other high ranking members of the Genovese crime family. It is important to understand by the year 2000, Local 17 in the Bronx was actually decertified and dissolved. It is no longer around. And all the people that were in that local ended up going to other union locals. Again, when they dissolve unions, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the mob has completely taken them over. So um, th that union is actually no longer around. By the early 90s, Vincent the Chin Giganti was mired in indictments, including the Windows case. And it was clear that uh, everyone around him was essentially being gobbled up as well. I mean, you look at people like Bobby Mana, he was going away. Um, you know, people like Salerno were long gone in prison. Uh, Giganti needed an up and comer that he believed could fill the role that he had had for so many years. It is alleged by the late 80s, Vincent Giganti would personally handpick Barney Belomo to be the next boss of the Genovese crime family. This is a guy, keep in mind, is 33 years old by 1990. Uh, that's pretty incredible. Uh, to go from being uh, in, in really, let's just say, 12 to 13 years, he goes from being a student in college to the boss of the most powerful criminal entity in New York. That's the kind of guy this guy was. He is incredibly intelligent. And I often wonder, this is an individual okay, that had the ability to do what he needed to do right in the streets. But he also had the street smarts that very few people had. He had the intelligence to go out and put it to work. You have to wonder, where would Barney Belomo have been if he had stayed in college? This guy would be, um, hey, would he make as much money as he had? I don't know. Uh, but he is a very smart individual who, from what I understand, really took care of his friends, took care of the people of his neighborhood in the Bronx and down in Harlem that he was around. Uh, just overall, I've heard nothing but good things about him, truly in the streets. Now, Barney Belomo did have some very interesting ways of conducting business. Um, it is said that he very uh, rarely would conduct meetings out in the open, if ever. Uh, again, he was known to be very smart and intelligent. And there are very uh, heavy rumors that for large parts of his comeuppance, he was doing and having meetings in housing project uh, neighborhoods where, you know, he could spot law enforcement and things like that. Um, this guy was incredibly adept at understanding how you behave as a gangster. And he took upon the mantle of the people before him, whether it was a Chin Giganti or whoever. Now, upon uh, gaining the title of boss, allegedly in the early 90s, we do know from history that Barney Beloma would ultimately be involved with a lot of uh, different things that he'd have to deal with. As we know, in 1991, Gambino, a former bodyguard and driver for John Gotti 
uh, and now Capo, Bobby Borriello would be whacked in the parking lot and drive of his home in Brooklyn. Ultimately, through the testimony of Mikey Scars D. Leonardo, we would find out that Junior Gotti actually asked for a meeting with Laborio Barney Baloma to discuss what exactly went on and why did uh, who he thought Preston Geritano, why did he kill Balomo? Ultimately, we'd find out that uh, Geritano was not involved with the hit on Borrell, and it was actually a Lucchese hitman, Frank Lastorino. But essentially, we would learn in the conversation that Barney Baloma pretty much told Junior Gotti that he wasn't going to do anything and that um, it, it almost seemed like Baloma didn't actually respect Junior Gotti. We look at the two individuals here for just a second. Balomo, the kind of success he had, the kind of gangster that he was, the kind of person that permeated success in the underworld. And you look at the other side, Junior Gotti. And at the time, for the most part, imbecile, uh, who probably should have never been in that world. Now, we will and can say Junior Gotti had some intelligence, but we look at them side by side, Junior Gotti and Balomo, uh, to call them both gangsters on the same level is absolutely ridiculous. And they're two totally different people. Uh, they just move totally different. Um, now, Balomo uh, would create himself a very high-ranking tri kind of triumvirate in the Genovese crime family. His underboss allegedly was Michele Mickey Domino Jenna Russo. Now, Jenna Russo could be seen here with his uh, daughter. Jenna Russo is a very old school guy. This guy goes all the way back to Lucky Luciano. He was made under Luciano. That's how deep he goes back. And from what I understand, Michele Genaruso, uh, initially when he got involved with the family, actually was very involved with the Jewish associates of the Genovese crime family. This is a guy that had all sorts of respect uh, in the Genovese crime family and for the most part was very respected. Probably could have been boss but he was the perfect guy to be toe-in-toe -toe with the young Balomo. The consigliere ended up becoming James, the little guy, Ida. Now, Ida is an uh, associate for a long time of Matty the Horse, Iniello, Iniello's driver at one point. Ida kind of would take over his crew when Iniello was uh, kind of elevated in the Genovese crime family. Things were good for Barney Balomo, though in 1996, they would begin to unravel uh, he would be charged alongside, um, not him, uh, him, uh, Michele Generuso, little Jimmy Ida, and other members of the Genovese crime family in a wide-ranging 65-count indictment that had everything from extortion, loan sharking, and even murder. For Belomo, this was a problem. Essentially, what would go on here is the Fed said he would be involved directly in two murders, a hit on a guy called... Ralph Cousin De Simone. De Simone would be found in a trunk at LaGuardia Airport. Now, the thought was he was an informant. The other murder that the Fed tried to pin on Belomo was the murder of a person called Anthony De Lorenzo. He would be found shot to death in the backyard of his New Jersey home in 1988. Now, the thought on him was he was acting very odd. The thought was he was selling narcotics, which was a no-no and he would be off as well. So the feds are trying to tie Belomo to both of these cases. Also in this indictment, a lot of it had to do with the mob's takeover of the San Gennaro feast in Manhattan. Basically, the government was saying that it was run by the mafia, everything from uh, games to food stands to everything. And there were all sorts of uh, soldiers from the Genovese crime family that were supposedly involved with the takeover on San Gennaro. Now, Baloma would go to prison and he would be housed for a long period of time in prison. The goal, though, of his counsel and his lead attorney, Ben Brathman, was getting the murders spiked from this. They wanted to completely get that away from this indictment and essentially probably plead to a deal, get 10 years, uh, and move on with their lives. The murders were bad for Baloma. Baloma would ultimately face three different lie detector tests and pass all three of them. Now, the government was not sold, according to the indictment, and um, they had actually suspected that Belomo, alongside Generoso, actually took uh, lithium 
which if you know anything about lithium is a psychiatric drug that can often um, kind of uh, make a lie detector test inconclusive or allow you to pass lie detector tests. Now, there was never any actual proof that Mr. Belomo did actually ingest lithium, but these are ultimately be taken out of the indictment. Belomo would plead and get 10 years in prison for his involvement in the racketeering charges of this indictment. Now, for him, this was great. Okay, there was nothing to tie him to these murders. And the lie detector individual that put these uh, lie detectors on actually uh, said that she actually believed that Mr. Belomo had no connection to either murder. So uh, the thought of a lithium, we have no idea. But Belomo would beat the rap uh, and ultimately get um, uh, lesser charges and uh, go to jail. But he was going to you know, get out you know, pretty soon. I mean, he's got a 10 year sentence. He's going to do, you know, eight or so. Now, the problem for Belomo was not the fact that he was going to go to prison. He had no problem and could deal with going to prison. Um, the fact was, though, there were people in the family that were very upset with the fact that they took a plea deal. Not only him, uh, but Mickey Domino, who was very old at this point. Both these guys wanted to get out of prison. They're not going to sit in prison for life and shit they didn't do. Uh, they're going to take a plea and get out. It's pretty simple. Now, as we know, old school gangsters don't take pleas. And little Jimmy Ida, who's also involved with this indictment, was absolutely disgusted that Belomo and Jenna Russo, who was kind of uh, curtailed into taking a plea by Belomo, Ida was disgusted with the fact that uh, Belomo was telling other members of the family to take pleas. From prison, it's alleged that Ida got in contact with none other than uh, Chin Giganti to essentially ask for Chin to have Belomo killed. Uh, Chin obviously scoffed at the idea and essentially said, go F yourself, um, and that never happened. Little Jimmy Ida uh, would get sentenced to life in prison. He is in his 80s and is still kicking, as far as I know. Uh, you have to ask yourself now, do you ever think Jimmy Ida wonders why he didn't take a plea? He'd be out a long time ago and could essentially spend the rest of his life with his family. This is the difference between some of these old school guys. They are dug in and little Jimmy Ida never took a plea. Now, Barney Belomo would head off to prison uh, and would face the fact that he would likely get out in the late 2000s, uh, but not so fast. In 2006, the federal government would bring another indictment on not only Belomo, but other members of the family, including John Buster Ardito, Ralph Balsamo, and Salvatore Sal Larca. Now, in that indictment, Belomo would face yet another murder conspiracy. They would say that he had a hand in ordering the murder of his childhood friend, Ralph Coppola. Now, Coppola was a member of his crew and at one point allegedly took over the 116th Street crew once he was arrested or he moved on to bigger and better things in Belomo. Now, the thing about this Coppola hit was Coppola was a friend of Belomo's. He was a good earner and many people believed he was skimming profits. Coppola would turn up dead uh, in 1998. Now, an individual would turn cooperator, a person called Peter Peluso. Now, Peluso was a lawyer and a messenger for the mafia all the way back to Tony Salerno. He would cooperate at one point. He would get jammed up in some dirt and decide to start talking. Now, the problem for Peter Peluso was in the Ralph Coppola hit, he would say that Belomo was the one that ordered it. But then he would also say on several different times, absolving Belomo, quote, he would have saved Ralphie if, if Beloma was out, he would have tried to save him and essentially said that Barney had nothing to do with this. He didn't even know this was happening. Why would he want his friend killed? If he were out, he would have saved the guy. Um, and there was just a lot of back and forth between Peluso. No one really believed Peter Peluso in the end. And down the road, Barney Beloma would be absolved and the charges would be dropped in this matter. In 2008, Laborio Barney Belomo would be released from federal prison and he would get to go home and spend time with his family and four kids. By this point, we would learn that he had three sons and a daughter and that his daughter actually would become a lawyer, a very uh, successful and honorable business uh, with shades of Meadow Soprano in a way, isn't it?
Um, as we know, Meadow Soprano always wanted to become a lawyer. Maybe the uh, creators of Sopranos took some storyline from uh, Barney Belomo's life. We'll never actually know. And in fact, during uh, some of his incarceration, Belomo's daughter would actually speak on behalf of her father. She would talk openly that he was a very good father and that um, he missed a lot of her high school years and, and the years of his younger brothers who were struggling with a little bit more than, than, than her. And I think that's, again, something I always anchor on this channel. In the eyes of the government, Barney Belomo is a mobster. But in the eyes of his family, he was a good dad that they didn't have for large parts of his uh, life. And I look at my own personal life. I mean, one of my dear friends has been in prison for a while. And, you know, it has taken a, a huge toll on his own family. Um, you know, we don't think about the families of these people enough. And, you know, again, in the case of Belomo, is he a convicted mobster? Absolutely. But uh, he does have a family in the end. For large parts of the 2000s, we would not hear much from Belomo. He would go back to his regular life and um, behave like he normally did in relative anonymity. Now, the family has continued to find its way through. The older generation has passed on. People like Petey Red Di Chiara or Vincent Giganti or uh, all these different guys, guys like Dom Cirillo and, and people like that have retired uh, in, in essence. Belomo is, though, still around. In fact, we would actually see him turn up in a very bizarre uh, way. Uh, in the late 2010s, early 2020s, uh, Belomo would be spotted on a Google Street View uh, on 187th Street and Cortona Avenue in the Bronx as he's seen carrying a pizza away from a pizzeria with his son uh, on the left here, who is in, in essence, looking at a phone of some sort and probably texting, but a very bizarre uh, thing. We don't see this much, but if we notice Belomo carrying a pizza, probably taking home uh, to enjoy a night uh, with his family, uh, dressed very, you know, normal, you know, jeans and a t-shirt, just like any other uh, middle-aged individual would be uh, in that uh, in that world. Um, we would also learn that in 2013, uh, Barney Belomo would sadly lose his wife who would actually pass away, and he is now a widower. He has four grown children. He lives in a very nondescript home in City Island in the Bronx. He has a small vacation condominium in Miami, and he has several construction, waste carting, uh, and uh, other businesses. He's very insulated, and I think it's very unlikely that the federal government will ever connect him to any uh, crime again. Um, he has learned in his life how to move in secrecy, um, do I believe he is a higher ranking individual in the Genovese crime family? Probably. Do I think he's the boss? No, I do not. I believe the boss is uh, this person, uh, Michael Ragusa, uh, someone who is also very uh, nondescript. This is the only picture there is of him uh, on the Internet. And they have adopted the typical front boss system, Salerno Giganti uh, anchored in the 80s. We don't actually know. The truth of the matter is, to me, both are high-ranking people, but in my opinion, they'll never connect them to anything again. Uh, they're just too smart for it. Belomo, though, would come up on these kind of funny things. But again, it's not illegal to have a pizza in the Bronx. Barney Belomo is an interesting person. In my opinion, if he'd have went a different way in life, he would probably be uh, a CEO or a doctor or something uh, of high-end ilk. But the truth of the matter is he's built a very good life for himself. He has done some time in prison, but for him, it's really just um, part of the world that he is from. He now gets to spend his time with his family, his kids, and his grandkids. Will we ever see Belomo in a federal prison again? I don't think so, but we'll have to wait and see. Barney Belomo is 65 years old. If you enjoy this video, make sure you hit that like button before you go and make sure you subscribe so you never miss another sit down video. If you'd like more great crime content, check out my podcast, The Sit Down, a crime history podcast. You can get it wherever you get your podcast, iTunes, Spotify, whatever. As I said, Merry Christmas. I hope you all have a great holiday season uh, and I will see you likely next week. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.